Hey guys, I'm John here with uh, the worship cohort with Casey Darnell. We are here at Buckhead Church, part of North Point Community Church. I'll go ahead and jump right in. Could you go ahead and just give us an idea of how you first got started as a worship leader and where it all began for you? And for me, uh, a lot of people get different starts. And, and for me, it was um, I was in a band and was singing and I've always been singing in high school and, and would try to lead. Uh, I went to a Christian school and would lead worship on Wednesdays and do praise team type stuff and sing in choir and octet and traveled and within our school we did a lot not like glee it was not that cool way less cool than that but um... not as auto-tuned or fixed either we sounded pretty rough um, but that's kind of where i got started with singing and then uh... in college i was really just drawn to doing youth ministry and working with students and actually in children's ministry is where i really started kind of leading a lot more singing to tracks and things but uh, at this church in particular um, I just volunteered on the, the praise band, the praise team, and, and I was like 20 years old, I think, and I'd been trying to figure out, a couple, you know, in college, the like first couple of years, and there wasn't really a, the movement that we have now with worship and how it's, how it's grown and blossomed at the time. Um, leading worship was, you know, you volunteered your time, and, and like, it was great, and yeah, I wasn't even allowed to get on the stage unless I was being mentored and discipled, and, and um, so I started volunteering that way, but more to do youth ministry. And then the singing started to kind of surface a lot more in my life. And, and when I was doing the band thing, I wasn't sure how to really lead worship. I didn't know what much of the difference was. I thought worship was singing, I could sing of your love forever at the end of a concert. And the band I was traveling with at the time, we did a lot of um, Christian festival concerts and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, my now wife then, at the time, was this girl I had met. And she said, hey, I really think you should listen to this, this music. And she gave me this paper bag full of worship CDs. And I didn't know what any of them were. Um, so the record called Hungry that she was in there had come out, and I think Road to One Day, Passions like first record, and maybe a couple of other ones. And uh, it just drew me in. I started listening to these songs and felt like these are not the same things I'm singing. It's about God, but more to God and more who He is, and not just stories or about how great a singer can sound. And it was more about the person that we're singing about. And it just started to really change my perspective of it. And, and I was volunteering in the youth ministry at the time and, and had uh, some guys mentoring me and, and, like I said, discipling and taking me out on the road with them some. And really got pushed by a, an amazing pastor named Ike Reichard. And he said, I mean, you need to be doing this. You need to do this. And I was like, I don't even know what this looks like. Uh, but being in youth ministry and sitting behind a desk and plotting out calendars for the year was not what God was you know, putting in my path. And so... I really started learning guitar and, and trying to be more focused in with leading and what it all in, it entailed. And, and that's when God started putting steps in front of me, opportunities to start doing stuff. So I never really made anything happen, never went after leading or even felt like, um, like you know, I had this moment where I was like, I'm called to lead worship. I just know I, he was moving me away from what I thought I wanted to do and putting people in my life that were giving me very clear, um, definitive, you know, this is something we see God doing in your life. And I trusted them. They were much older and wiser. and That's kind of how I got started. And my wife now uh, was very instrumental in, um, in pointing me in some directions away from things that were all about me and were all about how cool a band can look and more about who is the famous one. You are a part of North Point Ministries. What is your position here and what does it look like on a week-to-week -week situation? Um, so uh, with North Point, our church, there's I think, I think five campuses now. And, um, but then uh, apart from that, there's also our partner churches, and there's dozens of those that are scattered all over the country and even different parts of the world. And all that kind of networks together to make North Point Incorporated. And so you've got your music directors, and you've got um, production directors, and you've got all these staffed positions. And then um, underneath that, uh, you've got contracted worship leaders. And so uh, guys like Eddie, uh, he's on staff. And, and here at Buckhead Church, you've got Steve Marcy, and he's the music director. Um, and then he'll hire in, you know, the different leaders and musicians. And so I'm just one of a huge team of worship leaders here. Within North Point we have uh, a label um, that's been around for the last few years, growing and developing kind of on a steady, slower plot to um, set things up for reaching out to some of the artists like me. And uh, Ed, Eddie's on it, Todd Fields is on it, um, got him Seth is on it, and got him Shinwa is doing a record coming up. And, 
So the last record I released was through North Point Music, but uh, so affiliated, you know, a part of North Point, but um, not run by the same thing. And, and basically, at the end of the day, it, it's a part of a church, and so for me, the benefit is I don't have to uh, go travel around and, and be gone and sacrifice my family and playing everywhere I can. I get to be home, and when I'm home, that's a part of what I'm doing with North Point, and then they're helping take care of me and, and my family and and all that kind of stuff. So it operates just like a label. And Do you pursue writing more con songs that are more congregational or based on seasonal events in your life? Man, there's always that time of like, okay, we're writing a song or a meeting with a guy. I'm like, what are we writing for? Mm -hmm. And trying to make sure that we narrow the focus and go, okay, was this for the church to sing? Is this, I'm trying to think of um, a 50-year-old construction worker dad who's visiting our church right. and who's kind of hanging out going, I don't even know how to sing. You want me to sing that? Mm -hmm. How do I engage him? Or is this a song that um, I'm writing for my wife? <laughs> you know, there's, these are different perspectives. Right. And so within songwriting, I think you sit down and you have your kind of goal in mind, but then there's those times where, man, a song just floods to your heart and you kind of know what it's supposed to do. Um, or you start to develop it and you go, man, this is something I think the church could use. I think this people want to say, sing and say that. And you start kind of crafting the song around those guidelines of mm -hmm. what you, at least my perspective is, this is what has seemed to work well. And, but then that's always, you know, growing and changing. So uh, I don't know what if What is one thing that you. if you could tell a young worship leader in today's world, what would one thing you would, you would try to instill into them? I think coming back, having some kind of core place that you come back to so this is how I know what I'm doing. This is how I know who I am. Is because of what God's word tells me. Of this altar I built in my life, where I said, "God, this is when you showed me what you want me to do," and you just cloak that in God's word because that's truth. That's the real truth that we have, and um, I think that's very important for worship leaders to have God's word in your heart, um, and and have things that you know are constants in your life. Have wise counsel. You have people that are much smarter than you and older than you and been where you haven't gone yet speaking into your life, looking at your blind spots. Those things are so important. I have, I have numerous meetings a, a week. And then also I have young guys that I'll meet with or I'll try to pour into and because um, you learn when you're teaching sometimes. But uh, I definitely, I twittered, I'll go with Twitter, uh, I twittered this the other day because it, it broke me in half. And so um, I was just reading John 3.30 and it says he must increase and I must decrease and one version said he must become greater and greater and greater and I must become less and less and less and this is John the Baptist and I can't think of any scenario greater than maybe being him paving the way for Jesus and possibly looking at his life and going I'm carrying a lot of weight it's pretty important that I keep preaching you would think you know well, Jesus is one guy he's over here well if Jesus is over there how's he gonna reach these people Well, why don't I go over there and I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking about him, and, and maybe he needs my help, and maybe I need to try to, and try to, and try to, try to, and, you know, dominate. And there's all, look at all the masses of people. There was no churches. There was nothing, there was no movement of Christ yet. He, Christ was there, right. and yet John was going, if, if it cost me my life, it would be the best thing for me to get out of the way. I have to decrease. And if John said that, how much greater is it for us yeah. by the power of the Holy Spirit that he's left with us you know, years and years later to go, we need to keep decreasing. And even though we build big buildings and we write big songs or we, we make these big statements, all for the glory of God to reach people, these are, this is our reason. But somewhere in there, how am I decreasing in my life? How am I letting God be the thing that's greatest and magnified? And that's just something you have to keep coming back to. It looks different for a lot of people. And I think it's important that we have those moments that we can come back to, those hardcore, this is the truth of God's word, this is how I know I, who I am and what I'm called to. And, um, and it's okay to ask that question. And, uh, so I would, I would pass that on to every generation. If isn't, they aren't careful, um, the call to be you know, a husband and a father and to pour into a local body, a local church, which is what I get to do at North Point, um, that just it seems to not be the draw for people. It's more like, I want all those things, but I really want to hit the road or I want to... I want to have what it looks like that guy has on TV or what this worship leader has or what that guy has. Or how can I look as close to being in Maroon 5 but being a worship leader as I can? Or how can I mirror image what I see out there 
But then you go behind the scenes and find a lot of those guys are their families are falling apart. They're very lonely, mm-hmm. and um, and there's a lot of just junk going on. And, and so, um, I think ministry at the call of sacrificing your family for the kingdom of God. I would I would challenge somebody to show me where that, that's in the Bible, and um, and to show me where it says you should forsake your family mm-hmm. and you should um, you know let them suffer while you go out and, and try to make God's kingdom great. Because the reality is He doesn't need right. us. And um, we are very such a very small part in it. And uh, a lot of us, if we aren't careful, we only know how to love God and we look at ministry through first-person perspective of being on a stage. Mm-hmm. And we don't even know how to do one-on-one ministry anymore. We don't know how to talk to a guy at the gym. I talked to a guy today about running and we are just talking and... I didn't even know he went to Buckhead Church. I'm really glad I didn't make a fool of myself because he knew who I was and I had no idea. Right. But you start realizing, man, I, only, I need to make sure that ministry for me isn't just large perspective mm-hmm. or me having to sing or talk. Ministry is shooting a video or ministry is um, getting the trash. Right. Uh, ministry is, is um, a woman that I met on the road the other day who had fallen out of her car and couldn't get up. It, you never know what God might be putting in front of you to do. Mm-hmm. And it may not always be what we think it is. But we sure think we got it figured out. Yeah. So I think it's always kind of ministry is just, all right. Here's my yes today, God. Here I am. Obedience is my first, mm-hmm. is my first answer, and is the first requirement you have of me. So what do you require? And and not let it be all these other things that are driving us to find out what God wants us to do and what we're called to do, because of what all looks right. well, so Casey, awesome. Well, Casey, thank you for being with us and taking time out of your day. For all of you who want to know more about Casey and what's going on in his world, visit him at CaseyDarnell.com and take a look at WorshipCoolHeart.com to see what else is going on in your area. And we look forward to seeing you next time. When the waters rise around me, I am safe.